Poor, poor Clock Tower. Silent Hill fans think they have it bad? Try being a fan of this franchise. In less than a decade, this franchise went through it all. The first game was a revolutionary, groundbreaking title that effectively set the standards for the survival horror genre as we know it today, and then Clock Tower 2 introduced those standards to the rest of the world. Clock Tower Ghost Head <laughs> exists, and Clock Tower 3 brought the franchise in a totally different direction in a somewhat drastic attempt to keep the franchise afloat with unfortunately disappointing sales. And that is all she wrote. In the last video, we had a very extensive look at the entire Clock Tower franchise, shameless self-promo, but we failed to answer one very simple question. Is that really it? Was that it for the franchise? What happened after Clock Tower 3? Well, Hifumi Kono, the creator of the franchise and director of the first two games, noped out human entertainment well before they went out of business in 2000, eventually becoming the founder of Nude Maker, which is honestly kind of a weird name for a company, but don't worry, they just make games. They kind of made a variety of games too, mostly collaborative efforts like Steel Battalion with Capcom and Infinite Space with Sega. In fact, a lot of the Nude Maker employees were ex-human entertainment staff, so the spirit of Clock Tower was technically alive and well. So much so, in fact, that in 2014, the 20th anniversary of the Clock Tower franchise, fans were graced with a rather unexpected announcement. Nude Maker announced they were going to create an original horror game in the spirit of Clock Tower, and well, who better to direct it than Hifumi Kono himself, right? Not only that, but we had Masahiro Ito on board for creature design, aka the man who designed Pyramid Head, one of the most recognizable video game creatures ever. And, the icing on the cake, Takashi Shimizu, the director of both the Japanese and American versions of Jew on the Grudge, would be collaborating with Kono to direct the story as well as a live-action teaser trailer for the game. During its development, this game was nicknamed Project Scissors, but the final game we got was called Nightcry. Gameplay-wise, Nightcry would be very faithful to the original Clock Tower games, returning to the point-and-click style of the 90s and having the closest you can have to a scissorman-type enemy without getting sued. The Scissor Walker, as it's called in the game. Wielding a massive pair of scissors and hobbling after you during chase segments. The game would mostly take place on a massive ocean liner called the Oceanus. There would be multiple characters to play as, and again, as a throwback to the old Clock Towers, Nightcry would also have multiple endings. Now, these were all big promises, but it's important to note that this was, effectively, Nude Maker's first ever independent project. They weren't collaborating with a big budget company like Capcom or Sega this time, there was no publishers or contracts tying them down. This was, according to Kono, a complete passion project. But that meant that funding it was not so easy, and so they announced in January 2015 that Nightcrow would be a crowdfunded game. I remember when this Kickstarter was announced and like, damn, I was really excited. I knew it wasn't going to have the budget of the Clock Tower games before it, but Nightcry looked like it was going to be the closest we'd get to another spiritual successor. I mean, sure, Haunting Ground came out, but by 2014 that game was already closing in on being 10 years old. And the last time we had Hifumi Kono at the helm of a horror game was Clock Tower 2 in 1996. Sunsoft clearly weren't going to do anything more with the Clock Tower IP, so I was going to take what I could get. Initially, Nightcrow was planned to be released on iOS, Android, and the PlayStation Vita, uh, shout out to all three Vita owners, but Newmaker wanted to expand the game's content even further, beyond the limitations of a handheld, and also to make a PC release possible. To do this, they relied on the generosity of fans through both a Kickstarter and Campfire campaign, Campfire basically just being Japanese Kickstarter, to make this a reality, in total crowdfunding over 300,000 US dollars in just a month. It's not the multi-million dollar budget of most AAA games, but certainly if you're resourceful and use your funding wisely, you can make something pretty decent with that cash, I'd say. With this money, Kono and Shimizu promised to bring the ultimate Japanese horror experience to the world. Well, that's a tall claim. So, about that teaser trailer that Shimizu directed for the game. It's a 10 minute short film and acts as a prequel of sorts to the events of the main game, mostly following a kid called Sam as he sees creepy visions of the Scissor Walker. The film starts off with Sam playing Nightcry itself, hmm, pretty meta, and we even see a copy of Clock Tower 2 on the ground, so that is a pretty cute touch. We see brief shots of these cult worshipper looking people throwing a woman down a well, but overall the film mainly just serves to give us a glimpse of the areas we'll eventually get to further explore in the game. Some of the effects are a little dorky looking, but the Scissor Walker itself looks pretty cool given the likely low budget of this film, so kudos to Shimizu for going the extra mile to put this together. The film ends with the Scissor Walker claiming Sam as its first victim, and ends with an ominous shot of the Oceanus, soon to devolve into chaos. Nightcry finally released in March 2016, almost two years after its initial announcement, so that's enough of the exposition, let's go for it. Let's see what Nightcry has to offer. 
The game introduces us to Monica, a passenger aboard the Oceanus, as she heads back to her room from a party. We have a brief chat with one of the workers on the ship who's cutting up some fabric that looks like it's stained with blood. Uh, I don't know, Monica doesn't seem to notice, so I guess we shouldn't dwell on it too much either. Before she leaves, she notices the worker has some kind of nasty looking disease on his neck, which startles her a bit and she runs off. We meet a man in the cafe who calls himself Vigo, and it turns out he's the ship's owner. He says he wants to boil his prosthetic eye but doesn't have any matches, and this acts as a super brief tutorial on the basic gameplay functions and- Oh. Oh, oh no my man, what is that running animation? Dude, she looks like she's gonna topple over any minute, what the hell is this? Have the game devs ever actually seen a person in high heels? Because rest assured, it looks nothing like this man. Okay, dude, that is gold, but yeah, either way, the game shows us the basic gameplay mechanics, though there's not too much to explain here because the gameplay is pretty standard point-and-click affair. You literally just hover the mouse over the screen until this white icon shows up, indicating a point of interest or an item to pick up, then click on it to do just that. Using items is pretty simple too. You have an inventory here with unlimited space, you just click on the item you want to use, and then click on what you want it to interact with. If you've played Clock Tower or basically any point and click ever, this should all be pretty familiar territory to you. Nightcrack keeps its gameplay fairly minimalistic, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. As we head down the elevator, more and more weird things start happening, between a creepy old lady whispering things to herself and a vision of a ghost girl in the hallway. We eventually come across our friend Harry... or Dante? No, 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 that's gotta be the same model as Dante, right? From the DMC reboot? Same hair, same eyes, even his eyebrow shape is identical, dude, what? After doing a lot of research, this actually is apparently Dante's model from the game. There's good reason to believe Capcom sold off the assets to the 2013 Devil May Cry reboot because of how poorly it sold. Not only was Edgelord Dante banished to Nightcry, but after doing a little digging on Twitter, I found that apparently his model was also found in some random Vietnamese dental videos. Man, that reboot really never stood a chance, did it? Well, for anyone who did hate the reboot, you'll be happy to know that Dante dies in probably the most absurd way ever in Nightcrawler. Hey, you're thirsty, right? Here we go. What the? What is it now? Well, uh, something's grabbing my hand. What? I said something inside here is grabbing my hand. Oh, Harry, the Gregory Peck act is a bit outdated, don't you think? I'm serious! This is when we get our first taste of the chase segments in the game, another clock tower staple. During a chase, the fixed camera angles we see during exploration are changed in favour of a more over-the-shoulder camera. Right mouse click lets you look back to see how close the scissor walker is, and hitting the scroll wheel makes Monica Naruto run. Though something we have to keep in mind during these segments now is our stamina. The screen starts flashing red in the corners as your character gets more and more fatigued, which will eventually cause them to be more likely to fall over, to trip, and just stop to rest more often. If the scissor walker catches up to you when any of these things happens, it is game over. The biggest problem with this mechanic is it's very RNG heavy. You could run for ages without ever needing to stop in one chase, and then in the next chase you could fall over within two seconds. It takes a lot of control out of the player's hands and can lead to the occasional unfair death. Not to mention, environmental weapons aren't always immediately obvious and sometimes almost feel kind of rare to find. A design choice that reminded me very much of Clock Tower Ghosthead, so especially on a first playthrough, you could be doing a lot of running and a lot of tripping before you fend off the scissor walker. Ironically, the first weapon I found was a fire extinguisher, something I got very acquainted with in Ghosthead, giving me hella PTSD, or in Clock Tower's case, uh, CTSD. Not to mention, some of the ways you fend off the scissor walker are just dumb. Kono's last game, Clock Tower 2, was leaning very hard into that cheesiness, so a few tongue-in-cheek deaths were to be expected, but don't forget, Kono and Shimizu said Nightcrawler was meant to be the ultimate Japanese horror experience, while at the same time being a game where putting a bin on the enemy's head is all it takes to stop it. I'm all for B-movie horror, don't get me wrong, but don't try to advertise your game as being authentically scary, the ultimate Japanese horror experience, if it doesn't even come close to delivering that experience. Though thankfully, once you do find a means of getting rid of the scissor walker, it leaves you alone for quite a while. 
Unless I somehow entirely missed this on my multiple playthroughs of Nightcry, Scissor Walker encounters are only triggered by either cutscenes or interacting with specific items. It doesn't show up randomly as you explore or anything like that. So while the chase segments can be annoying, at least they are few and far between. This fact is a double-edged sword though, because it also means you can go really long periods of time with no actual horror happening. The fact there's not even a randomized element to the only threat in the game kills any sense of urgency or dread that the previous clock towers had. This became painfully obvious after my first playthrough, when I knew exactly what would trigger the scissor walker, so I just avoid them. <laughs> I'd rarely ever see the scissor walker and there aren't really many scary panic inducing or creepy things when you're just exploring so you know you'd almost forget you're meant to be playing a horror game. You'd just be wandering empty hallways at a snail's pace with these dorky ass running animations looking for the next cutscene or puzzle item. The scissor walker's mechanics are in fact a downgrade from the clock tower games that came out almost 20 years before it. This is all worsened by the game's incredibly sloppy presentation. Dude, it's lacking. It really is. Nightcry is a buggy mess from start to finish and feels more like an early build of a game rather than the finished product. The money from the Kickstarter either wasn't enough to optimize this game for PC or the devs just really didn't give a shit because there are so many technical and visual hiccups throughout the entire game. It could be the character models freaking out for a second, it could be lighting issues or even just sound effects giving up after a while. There was a visual glitch that kept happening as I played where every time a camera angle would change during a cutscene, there'd be this jarring rogue frame in the middle. I edited all of them out for the sake of the video, but it was very noticeable and honestly just got really annoying. A character we play as later on in the game had this really annoying bug too, where she would just wiggle every single goddamn time she opened the door, and this was a big problem if the scissor walker was hot in your tail when it was happening. It was on every door too, like how is this not noticed and fixed during development? Even the controls are bad, man. Like, the gameplay is just flawed in every feasible way. Even just walking down a staircase can be challenging because of how needlessly specific your clicks have to be. You could click very clearly where you want the character to go and they'll find some way of either going off track or will just stop entirely. The camera angles make this even harder too. Like, dude, look how long it took me to just walk into this shop. Like, seriously. The music in this game isn't too shabby and can be quite suspenseful at points. Not really surprising as we have Michiru Yamane and Nobuko Toda on board, the composers for Castlevania and Metal Gear Solid respectively, two franchises with very well-known excellent music. But the game kind of ruins that music by overusing the same tracks very often, or at least it feels like it. The devs were very ambitious getting such high-profile composers on board, but I imagine composers of that caliber cost quite a bit, so that would explain the repetition in music. The chase music, while suspenseful, also doesn't feel hectic and panic-inducing enough. The chase themes in previous Clock Towers have always been high-octane, intense and fast-paced songs to capture the pure panic of being hunted down, but in Nightcry it's a lot more toned down and eerie. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but it just doesn't feel like it matches the intensity of what's happening on screen to me personally. And it's not helped that the music has a tendency to just cut in and out at random intervals, which just ends up being awkward. The music is not bad by any stretch, it's just not terribly memorable, in my opinion. It also costs 20 euro to buy the digital soundtrack on Steam. That price is almost higher than the amount of tracks that exist in the game, and is almost as expensive as the game itself. Make of that what you will. Oh boy, but probably the worst offenders in this game are the puzzles and just overall progression. Nightcry is pure evil. Very reminiscent of Clock Tower Ghosthead, there is no rhyme or reason to how you progress in this game. The puzzles can be quite abstract and absurd in their logic, and you might think, oh, well, that's par for the course with survival horror, right? And I crazy throwback to 90s point and click, of course the puzzles will be difficult. And that may be true, but even when you're intentionally designing a game to be difficult, there are limits. Even games that are throwbacks to their older counterparts need to keep in mind that they're being designed for a modern audience, and finding the middle ground to satisfy both parties is key. That middle ground is nowhere to be seen in Nightcry. Remember how in the last video I talked about that samurai suit that if you didn't do something really specific at the beginning of the game, then it would fall out of the sky and kill you randomly? That is still probably one of the most cruel softlocks I have ever seen in a game. That is this entire game. This game is Softlock City. 
actually finding the correct route to get to the end of the game is like a goddamn minefield, and I'm both impressed and deeply sympathetic to the first few people who played this game before it had walkthroughs. Mistakes you make in the first hour of the game can cost you so many wasted hours later when you realize you didn't do something that's now locked you into a bad ending. The first, and in my opinion the most cruel example of this, is in Chapter 1 as Monica. If you happen to interact with this one specific vending machine, Monica will make a passing comment that she's thirsty but doesn't have any money on her. You can find change in a nearby shop and when you try to buy a drink, a severed hand will come out instead. Ooh, spooky. The hand will be holding a wedding ring. Picking up this ring is crucial to progressing through the rest of the game, as unimportant as it may seem at first. If you don't have this ring, the last character won't be able to find a key item and boom, you're locked into a bad ending. No, like the game will seriously let you progress from the beginning all the way to the end before completely screwing you over and forcing you to restart from the beginning. Mind you, when I say bad ending, ending is a very liberal use of the word. The game has eight endings total, more or less all of them being glorified game overs bar like two at best. I mean, dude, you can technically get this ending in the first chapter of the game, which is exactly what happened to me. No. Oh. <gasps> like, who the hell are those guys? Why did the scissor walker just show up in the water as a reflection? Is it, is it a sea monster now or something? Is that it? Monica's not even dead, she's still alive and afloat. Swim, try to live, do something. That's not an ending, that's a game over. Look at Silent Hill 1, for example. That game has five endings, and even the bad ending still provides some kind of conclusion to the story. You've still technically beaten the game and experienced the story, but seeing that result screen, you realize, oh, I could have done better, let's try that again. In Nightcry, the bad endings can cut the game super short and are just so vague, offering no closure. What I'm saying is the game allows you to softlock yourself very early and willingly lets you proceed throughout the majority of the game, knowing you won't be able to see a decent ending without giving you any opportunity to rectify the mistake you didn't even know you made. What I'm saying is... It's shit. This game is shit. It, it blows. This game blows, man. <laughs> I could make an entire video on all the softlocks in this game, but I think a better way of communicating how evil Nightcry can be would be to just walk you through the story with me and I'll fill you in as we go. The story is most certainly nothing to write home about, and the game is not worth pushing through to experience it, but just in case, here's your spoiler warning for Nightcry. We're going to be talking about that for the next while. Skip to here if you don't want to hear any of it. This has been your warning. Okay, let's go. So, after being hunted by the Scissor Walker and everyone around her on the ship being murdered, Monica wants off the Oceanus, understandably enough. One of the people who was murdered is her friend Jessica. Remember that, I'll be bringing that up again later. Monica manages to make her way to the ship deck, coming across that worker with the nasty disease from earlier, Eric. They both agree to escape together, and that concludes Monica's chapter. Our next protagonist is Leonard, a professor aboard the ship who has possibly the goofiest running animation I've ever damn seen. We come across Eric again? He's back? He's back now? Okay. Didn't he say he was going to escape? Why is he back again now? Okay, whatever. <laughs> anyway, Leonard and Eric notice that all the life rafts are missing and comment on a nearby island that seems to have a bonfire. Taking a guess that passengers might have escaped the ship to hide on the island, Leonard, Eric, and this guy decide to use the last emergency life raft to travel over and see what's up. Leonard quickly comes across these people in strange masks patrolling the area, and here is where we get the world's shortest stealth segment. Yep, that was it. In one of the huts on the island, we find a strange eerie red pit with a few people stuck in it. I don't know if they're meant to be demons or like actual real life people or if this is some culty stuff going on, but either way, this pit is never mentioned or brought up in the story again, so I guess we'll never know. Something I forgot to point out is that while exploring, you can sometimes randomly find these photos of real people who I can only assume are the developers of the game. So you could just be exploring this demon worshipping cult island and you'll just find this photo randomly. I mean, it's a cute idea, but couldn't they have found maybe a less jarring way to do it? But hey, it's whatever. Leonard manages to find a mask to disguise himself amongst the cult members and explore the island further before he's suddenly attacked by a ghost or apparition or mini tornado. I don't really know what that's meant to be. Leonard smashes the mirror, which somehow actually gets rid of the ghost, and then we never see or hear anything about that apparition again, or ever find out what it even was, so cool. 
Disguising ourselves as a cult member who seem to go by the name of the Faithful, we come across them sacrificing people, which is something you clap for apparently. In a nearby cabin we find a whole bunch of goodies. We find a book that talks about repentance and overcoming the fear of death, which even Leonard struggles to make sense of, a strange preserved hand that apparently has mystical properties, and a prosthetic eye. Wait, that guy back in the first chapter had a prosthetic eye. Yeah, the game just kind of spoils its own villain way before the ending. This room, believe it or not, is like the ultimate place to soft lock yourself, by the way. If you don't read that nonsensical book, you lock yourself into a bad ending way later on. And if you don't warn your students to keep a lookout for the man with the prosthetic eye, the characters won't know to be wary of Vigo and you'll also get another bad ending. If all that wasn't bad enough, if you happen to forget to pick up a pair of non-stick gloves earlier in this chapter, you won't be able to go down this well without falling and have to restart the entire chapter. So, you know, that's that's just epic. This is a pretty good time to point out that the dialogue box in this game kind of has a mind of its own. Like, in some cutscenes you can skip along the text at your own pace, and then in other cutscenes you're forced to wait for the dialogue to move by itself. Hmm, seems to be a post from Jessica. Jessica, I was wondering what had happened to her, so she was on this island too. Mm-hmm. Go on. Alright, is, is the game frozen? Oh, no. Uh, if she's at the bottom of this well, I must rescue her. <laughs> Go on. The text box is- oh, oh, no, we're back. We're back in action, boys. Going to the bottom of that well we just mentioned, we stumble upon a very strange ritual room with a coffin in the center. Oh man, that's a little insensitive, Leonard. Jesus. We find a guy called Jerome in this coffin, who is someone Leonard clearly seems to know. Looking around the room further, we slowly figure out that it seems some kind of ritual is set to take place on the Oceanus. And with this new information, Leonard decides the best thing to do would be to bring both himself and Jerome back onto the dangerous soon-to-be ritual site ship instead of, you know, just hiding somewhere in safety until they're rescued. On their way back to the ship, Leonard is attacked by a cult member, and that's that for Chapter 2. Moving on to the final chapter of the game, we now play as Rooney, a relative of Leonard and fellow classmate of Monica. We're at some sort of party on board the ship and... Oh, Leonard's back? What? And Monica too? Isn't that the Jerome guy we just found in a coffin? <laughs> I guess we've gone back in time now? Hmm, so in a rather confusing narrative choice, we've jumped back in time to just before shit went down with the Scissor Walker, but before long it shows up anyway to wreak some havoc. Now, the area in this chapter is noticeably way bigger than the previous two, and funnily enough, a lot of the rooms are just empty with nothing of interest at all. It kind of reminds me of Clock Tower 2, where the final area was disproportionately long compared to the rest of the game, and a lot of the area just feels like extra padding to make exploration take longer. Game Design 101, baby! We managed to get in contact with our classmates who are taking refuge in a cargo hold in the shopping area and- Yo! That's- that's Vigo! That's- that's the villain! He's just chilling there! We have a text from Leonard on our phone telling us to look for a guy with a prosthetic eye. Rooney, he's right there. He's right there. <laughs> but no, it's more convenient to the plot for Rooney to not notice, so she just doesn't. I want to touch upon a kind of subplot that happens in Rooney's chapter and, more importantly, how terribly it's told. I normally would try to avoid these kind of topics in my videos, but Nightcry kind of blindsided me with how insensitively it handled these topics and I'd really like to talk about it. I will be touching upon some of the topics listed below here, so trigger warning if you are sensitive to any of these things, and I will also provide the timestamp here if you want to skip past this to when we'll be getting back to just the general plot of the game. Okay, here we go. A large focal point of Rooney's character during her chapter is her mental health. Rooney's a very quiet person and seems to be disregarded by her classmates quite a bit. In the first few minutes of her chapter, she even attempts to take her own life by jumping into the ocean, but Jerome stops her and ends up talking out a lot of their feelings, relating to her in a lot of ways. Initially, I found this story to be quite random, considering the tone of the game up until this point, but unfortunately, it gets a lot worse. More or less every character that isn't Jerome verbally abuses and degrades Rooney about her very clear depression and suicidal tendencies, even going so far as to nickname her the Death Wish Diva. That's bad enough as it is, but it gets worse once you reunite with the other survivors a while into the chapter. We briefly speak to Maria, who is worried about Leonard, saying she hasn't heard from him in a while. Then, without warning, she starts to point out the irony in the fact Rooney is alive and well while Leonard is in danger, saying that it should be the other way around, considering Rooney has a death wish. Even the other characters are very dismissive of Rooney when she says she wants to go out there and find them an escape route, with Kelly going so far as to tell her, it's your life, go throw it away, see if I care. The worst part about this entire subplot is their behaviour and verbal abuse towards Rooney goes completely unchecked. 
No one ever defends her, and none of the characters even show remorse or regret for speaking to her the way they do. If anything, Rooney's declining mental health is belittled and used as something to poke fun at during conversations, and beyond all that, this subplot doesn't really do anything to add to the overall story. You can't really say that Rooney overcomes these hurdles and grows from the experience, because even during the ending, one of the other characters uses her so-called death wish as an insult against her. I have no words to describe the storytelling other than disgusting and offensive. In an era when mental health is a topic that's finally getting the attention it needs and people are learning more about the mental health issues that plague so much of the population, this writing is just in poor taste. The characters never face any consequences for their actions, which is basically the game telling the player that it's okay to treat people like this. As well as that, some of the dialogue could be incredibly triggering for people playing this who may be struggling with the same internal battles that Rooney is. I don't know what message Kono and Shimizu were trying to communicate with this subplot, but frankly, it just left me feeling upset. Upset to be reading such cold words that real people likely hear on a daily basis, and upset that someone could write this into a story with so little regard for those who may indeed hear it in real life. It's not that you can't write about these topics, it's not that you can't write asshole characters who would say these things, but if you do, you need to handle them with the utmost care. For the average player, these may just be words on a screen, but for some people, these are words they have to endure in real life. And even in a video game with fictional characters, these words can hold weight. Needless to say, this subplot in Nightcry handles the topics of mental health, depression, and suicide in an absolutely revolting and tone-deaf way. I don't care if this is just a video game. The dev team were wrong for writing this into the story the way they did and handling it so poorly. And for all the flaws that Nightcry has, this is above and beyond the worst one to me. Anyway, you might be wondering amidst all this what the hell happened to Monica from Chapter 1. Well, we find her locked up in a container and she can't remember who did it to her. If you remember, the last person we saw Monica talk to was Eric. Eric was also with Leonard when he got attacked. Then, not too long after all this, we get a call on her phone from Jessica. Remember Jessica? The one who died in Chapter 1? Thanks to the fact the game likes to jump around the timeline a lot, it's kind of hard to know if she's actually dead yet or if this is her ghost contacting us from beyond, but either way, she tells us to be wary of that Eric guy saying he's dangerous. Well, rather conveniently, we come across Eric right after that phone call. He gives us a medicine and says we should take it for safety's sake, without really specifying why we should. So, anyone playing this would naturally think, well, that Eric guy sure seems suspicious. He almost definitely had a hand in Monica and Leonard disappearing, and we literally got a phone call from Jessica telling us to not trust him specifically. A lot of people playing this, myself included, would think, yeah, screw that guy, I'm not taking this medication, surely that'll give us a bad ending. What? Yeah, the game gave us every reason to think that Eric guy was bad news, and then when we are given the option to trust him, you actually have to. Or else you get a bad ending and turn into a zombie. They're zombies now? Oh my god, this game really is Clock Tower Ghost Head, isn't it? So taking the medicine and avoiding the bad ending, we find ourselves in the hospital on the ship and come across Leonard, um, missing his skin now? <laughs> Why? With his dying breath, he asks us to turn off the life support and we do it. Fun fact, if you didn't interact with that nonsensical book back in Leonard's chapter, you don't even have the option to turn off the life support, once again locking you into a bad ending. I don't understand how Leonard reading a book gives Rooney the courage to turn off his life support, but uh, yeah man, okay, word. We eventually find our way to the staff offices on the ship and find one of Vigo's diaries. We learn that Vigo is behind all this, which we already knew because the game spoiled itself like three hours ago, as well as Jerome, who is actually Vigo's son. But Jerome is also the son of Vigo's daughter Yolanda, so that means that Vigo and Yolanda... You know. And also this diary entry calls Jerome Otto for some reason, which really confused me at first because I don't remember anyone in the game called Otto. I don't know if that's a reference or something. Dude, I don't know. The game is just dumping all this exposition in the last few minutes because it doesn't know how to tell a story. We also find all this cash, but yet yeah, Rooney decides the only important thing to take here is this prosthetic guy. Okay. We finally manage to track down Vigo in this massive ballroom and he tells us we're embarking on a cruise to eternal paradise. Monica comes to save the day, but Rooney realizes there's only one thing she can do to protect herself from the scissor walker. Remember that prosthetic guy from earlier? Well, apparently it's got magical powers that were never really clarified or explained at any point in the story. So what does Rooney do? You know, 
I kind of feel like ripping out your eyes is a bit of a drastic move. I probably would have tried to see if it worked without having to go that far, but... You know, whatever, the game needs its dramatic ending, and I guess that was it. Anyway, this prosthetic eye seems to be able to control the scissor walker, and this is when we get the voice acting performance of a lifetime, baby. Wait! This can't be! No! No! This can't be! Wait! Wait! Oh, come No! Hey! No, no, no! Wait! Wait! No, wait, wait. No. 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 Wait. No. Wait. This is Barry Gerb, by the way, the voice actor for Barry from Resident Evil 1 and Rick from Clock Tower 2. How they managed to get him back after all these years, I have no idea. Donna Burke also did some voice acting for this game, the voice actors for Angela and Claudia from the Silent Hill games. And you wouldn't even think it, considering how little voice acting there is in the first place. And everyone lives happily ever after. That was Nightcry. The hilarious thing about the story in this one is it leaves you with so many more questions than it does answers. What's up with Eric and that disease he had going on? Uh, was that the same disease as the zombies we saw in one of the bad endings? Uh, how do zombies fit into this while we're at it? And uh, what about the cult? Uh, who were those people exactly? And what was the purpose of the Eternal Paradise ritual? Uh, while we're at it, what did that ritual entail exactly? Was it just to kill everyone? Why did it specifically have to take place on the Oceanus? What was up with that hell pit on the island? And why was Jerome out cold with all those markings on his back? Why was Leonard killed the way he was, and where exactly does the scissor walker tie into all this? The backstory to the Barrows twins and Clock Tower was so clear. They were just two demon children in a cursed lineage. But the scissor walker's reason for existing is a lot less clear here. It really feels like this project started out with a lot of ideas for a much more detailed story, and they either lost interest halfway through or blew the budget on useless things and had to drop all those plot threads by the end of it. I don't think it needs much explaining how messy this story is. It is one of the most poorly told plots I've ever seen in a video game, and it's just not interesting. Simple as. At least with a game like Clock Tower Ghost Head, there was elements of an interesting story, it was just poorly told. With Nightcry, it's both uninteresting and poorly told, so there's just no winning here. Combine the weak story with frustrating, fickle gameplay, a fine but forgettable soundtrack, and super ambiguous puzzles and progression that make playing the game feel like a minefield, and it's hard to justify the almost 30 euro price tag this game is going for. And above all else, the game just isn't scary. I know you could argue the game is going for that goofy, cheesy horror that so many 90s games were doing, and that's perfectly fine if it is, but that's not how the game was advertised. Remember, this is apparently the ultimate Japanese horror experience. Yikes. So, Nightcry is garble. Can't say I'm surprised, it's exactly what I was told going into that game. But what if I told you that the game itself wasn't even the worst part? No, no, no. The game is bad, yes, but I was quite surprised there was an even worse train wreck when it comes to Nightcry. It's Kickstarter. I very briefly mentioned the Kickstarter at the beginning of this video, but I'd like to delve into that a little bit further, because there is a lot to unpack here. そして今度行こうと思っています。素晴らしいチームと、ま、力を合わせて日本最高峰のえ、ホラーゲームのサウンドを目指したいと思います。音楽とコーパーのサウンドで調査に行きたいと思います。このゲームこそ皆さんが
So piecing together the timeline of this game's Kickstarter development was surprisingly easy because all 900 plus comments from Kickstarter backers are still available to read to this day. Most of the comments are backers complaining, calling the developers scammers, which when you hear the story in a minute are very valid claims, but uh, if you want to see the chaos unfold for yourself you're more than welcome to, but from what I can understand, this is how the Kickstarter went down. Like I said earlier, Nightcry was initially only going to be released on iOS, Android, and the PlayStation Vita. It was only after the game's initial reveal when Nudemaker realized that fans were clamoring for a PC port too, which spurred them to set up crowdfunding to make this a reality. Nudemaker and their publishers Playism Games did indeed reach their base goal of $300,000, pooled together from over 2,400 very generous backers. This money should ideally be more than enough to vastly improve the game. For an indie project, money like this can completely reshape the game for the better. So what did Newmaker promise these dedicated fans? So in some of the trailers on the game's Kickstarter, you can see an early build for the PC version of the game, and what I found fascinating was the early build looks better than the final game, in my opinion. Take this trailer for example, released on February 3rd, 2015. Right off the bat, the colours are a lot warmer, the lighting effects are pretty good too, and there's this ominous reddish fog going on. I think the warm colours complement the graphics quite well and it's just overall quite visually appealing to look at. Now let's compare that to the final game. The warm colours are completely gone now for a visual direction that is a lot more flat and less foreboding looking in my opinion. This scene in the trailer is a great example of what I'm trying to say here. The warm reds and oranges and the harsh shadows that lighting creates makes this a very striking shot, whereas in the final game all of this is gone, lacking any vibrancy and overall leaving us with a much more underwhelming visual than we were promised. The lighting isn't the only thing that was changed in the final release. Monica's face was completely different in the initial trailers as well. She was a lot more kawaii uwu looking. <laughs> but I definitely think when you look at the two of them side by side, the textures and modeling in the initial trailer are a lot smoother and better looking than the final product once again. Especially if you look at the way her eyes were designed, which in my opinion looks significantly worse in the final release. This is a perfect example of how lighting can actually enhance the graphics, but once that lighting was taken away in Nightcry's case, it shows up the low budget the game has. There are also times in these trailers where Monica's original model shows emotion a lot better and just looks more distressed when she needed to be. In the final game, I don't think it looks nearly as good. Even the second gameplay trailer that released only two weeks after the first one has dramatically different lighting once again. This time way darker, almost too dark at points, so I don't know what was going on with the devs and why they couldn't seem to settle on just one art style. Whichever version you think looks better is entirely up to you, but you can't deny that there is a dramatic difference between what was shown to us in 2015 and what we actually received in 2016. Not a very good look for Nude Maker, not gonna lie. Ironic that a few comments say this looks decent for an early build and they're looking forward to seeing improvements in the final release, only for the final release to look much worse. A good portion of the comments on these videos are people pointing out these strange running animations and also asking for tank control support as well. While tank controls would definitely defeat the purpose of Nightcry being an ode to point and click survival horror, I do think that it would have been a great inclusion for accessibility. Now I don't know the feasibility of programming an entirely different control system into a game, for all I know it could be a lot more expensive and a lot more complicated than it sounds. I think if it was possible, having both would have been the best of both worlds. I know at least personally, a lot of people I know don't have the patience for point and clicks anymore. If they were becoming outdated in the late 90s, then they are most certainly dated in 2022. I know asking for tank controls might have been asking for a lot, but it is a very understandable thing to ask for. Well, none of these critiques were taken on board because the final game only has terribly programmed point and click functionality and her running animations are just as goofy, if not worse, so like, Whatever. There was one final trailer released over a year later on March 22nd, 2016, only days before the game's release. Interestingly, none of the scenes we saw in the 2015 trailers are shown here, and I can't help but wonder if this was intentional, so that people wouldn't notice the massive graphical downgrade the game had. If I were to take a guess, I imagine the devs were overambitious early on in development and blew a lot of the budget on the lighting and models, but as soon as they realised, oh shit, we need to make the entire game look like this, they had to go back and simplify the graphics. Needless to say, I imagine a lot of the Kickstarter money was wasted on this. Unfortunately, other promised features in the game were also not delivered. The description on Kickstarter promised full facial animation and lip syncing in the game and at absolute best 10% of the cutscenes have that in the final game. They also said the scissor walker would be able to hear your phone ringing and it would alert it to your location but that simply does not exist in the final game. 
Once again, more promises that were not kept. So lots of false promises and downgrades, that's already pretty shady business for a game, right? Then we get to the backer incentives on Kickstarter, and that's when things really get messy. <laughs> Looking at the backer incentives, Nudemaker were clearly very keen on getting people to support this game, having a lot of incentives, going all the way up to a $10,000 reward, which lets you attend a special dinner with Shimizu, Kono, and Ito themselves. I would love to know how that went for those two backers. So you have your standard rewards like getting a digital copy of the game for $20 and getting digital art books and soundtracks alongside it if you pay $50. Then you get to the $75 reward, which is a physical boxed version of Nightcry with an authentic DVD ROM and manual. Pretty retro, pretty old school, we love to see it. And if you went the extra mile and paid $120, then you got the collector's edition for the game. This collector's edition promised a physical copy of Nightcry, much like the lower tiers, a physical soundtrack and a physical art book. So yeah, you know, pretty cool rewards on paper, right? Definitely, you know, would get the collectors involved. I know I would definitely be tempted by that. But things got a little shaky a few months after the money was raised when Nudemaker kind of just went radio silent on backers in the updates section on Kickstarter. I can't personally read some of these updates as I was not a backer for this game, but you can see that they were posting pretty consistently up until June 2015. And then there was a big gap until October 2015 with the title, The Silence is broken. <laughs> Some of these Kickstarter updates don't sound very promising or confident either in their wording, like this one called Deciding Our Fearful Future, and this one called Some Updates and Clarifications, being very closely followed by one called Let's Try This Again. <laughs> So anyway, they showed up again. Great, cool. Now, keep in mind, the game released in March 2016. In May 2016, there was an update called Shipping Physical Versions, then followed by a post in July 2016 called Physical Rewards Shipping Update. So, okay, I guess they didn't get to ship it the first time, fair enough. Uh, then there's another update, uh, this time in October, another Physical Rewards update. Uh, happy Holidays, another update in January 2017, and another, and... Uh, finally, shipping dates, March 2017, a full year after the game actually released. And they still didn't even get shipped until two months later, in May 2017. The entire time that these collector's boxes were delayed, people were leaving comments in the Kickstarter forums asking for updates or even just, you know, a mock-up or visuals of what these rewards were even going to look like. But these were all very conveniently ignored. So people who paid $200 to get a signed collector's box of the game had to wait almost two years to actually receive it. Think about that for a second. <laughs> Funnily enough, in the FAQ for the Kickstarter, they promised that they would ship all physical and digital rewards for Nightcry by the end of 2015, but they couldn't even manage that much. So, after all this waiting, after getting no visual or mock-up at all at what these physical rewards would look like, what were they like? Was it worth the two year wait? I obviously was not able to get my hands on a collector's edition, but I reached out to two backers for this game, El Capo Ninja and Charles Macaluso, who very generously allowed me to use their unboxing videos in my video. I'm gonna drop their YouTube links below, please do subscribe to them and give them some love, and thank you again to both of you for being such a massive help for this video. So, collector's box is a very liberal use of the word here, it's really just a standard low quality black casing you could probably find in any shop for two euro. The soundtrack and art book are there too, but the art book looks very bare bones and low quality. Uh, that's not an art book, that's a pamphlet. That's a simple soft cover manual that you get with any game. Not something you'd expect from a $200 limited edition of a game. The actual art in it seems very sparse as well. This is a very weak effort on Noob Maker's part, and if you told me this was just some fan-made physical edition of the game, I would have been none the wiser. At best, it looks like the art booklet has 10 to 15 pages, which is just the absolute bare minimum you would expect. Even if not a lot of artwork was produced for the game, you know, it is an indie game after all. You could at least make up for it by making the book itself a little more visually appealing, you know, something worthy of calling a collector's item. Not just some booklet you could print yourself. I, I, the reward I wanted was the side boxed collector's edition for, and I'm ashamed to say, $205 not including shipping. So we're gonna do an unboxing of this. Not that there's much, this is all it came in. There's there's no box, I don't, I don't see a box. I see a DVD case, which a cheap one at that. According to Charles, another Nightcry backer had their collector's box arrive soaking wet, so much so that the art book was virtually destroyed. 
And considering how poor the devs are communicating with their backers, I somehow doubt they got a replacement for that. One of the comments on this video also raises an interesting point about the signed versions of the Collector's Edition, saying, You might want to take a look at the signatures on your copy and compare them to what was exampled on the Kickstarter page for their last update. Obviously, variations are going to be had, but looking at the vertical signature on the back, the style of handwriting doesn't even come close. One feels almost like cursive, with flowing, elegant curls, and yours looks like block letter plain text. It makes me wonder if they actually had the respective artists sign these, or if they had a couple secretaries copy signatures used somewhere else. And it gets even worse. One of the backers did a breakdown estimating how much this collector's box would have likely cost for the developers to produce. You know, how much would the casing, the CDs, and the booklets cost? Five dollars. Five dollars for something they charged two hundred dollars for. It gets even worse. The $800 pledge promised an exclusive DVD copy of rare short films all directed by Takashi Shimizu. I saw a lot of comments of people saying they never received this DVD and I'm convinced it doesn't exist. After very extensive research, it seems no one ever received this DVD. Backers who pledged lower amounts of money weren't safe either. I saw plenty of comments of people who paid $20 to get a digital code for the game were saying they still hadn't received that code months after release. Something you literally just have to email to someone was too much to ask of Nude Maker and players and games. Even some people who somehow managed to get a code off of them said they were often invalid and it took them weeks or months to get a response from either company with a replacement code. As I mentioned during the review, some of the backer incentives involved you being turned into an NPC in the game, or you would have your photo show up in the Instagram app that the protagonists all use, and they're just really jarring with how they show up in-game. I feel if you're going to offer something like this, you need to weave it naturally into the game so it doesn't stick out like a sore thumb, but you can really tell the devs didn't put much thought into how to actually implement these incentives. But they knew that offering them would get them a bit of extra cash, so they didn't really care about that, did they? So you might be wondering to yourself at this point, uh, what about the Vita and phone versions of the game? Tango's not making any mention of that. The Vita version was massively delayed. It came out in 2019, three years after the PC version of the game. While I wasn't able to play it for myself, mainly because I didn't want to spend any more money on this game than I already have, apparently it's even more buggy than the PC version, despite the three year gap in release. Not to mention, while America got the Vita version in January 2019, it seems Europe had to wait even longer. While I couldn't find a concrete date on when we did finally end up getting it, because even the PlayStation Store website likes to think Nightcry doesn't exist, from what I researched, it seems Europeans didn't get the game on Vita until about September or October of 2019. As for the iOS and Android versions of the game, they're still not out. Almost 10 years after the goddamn game got announced in 2014, and the phone versions still aren't available, despite being the first platforms that the game was announced for. And the Facebook page for Nightcry has been dead since 2019, so no chance of getting a response there. So what did I do? I emailed Noob Maker, obviously. <laughs> I can't get enough of this game, I need that phone version, goddammit! Uh, they didn't respond. And that's really where the story ends. Newmaker preyed on people's nostalgia for the Clock Tower franchise and used it to make a quick buck to line their pockets. And it clearly worked because that money sure as hell didn't go into Nightcry itself. It's an unfinished, sorry excuse for a game that is an insult to the legacy of Clock Tower. Hifumi Kono scammed his own fanbase. So that's why I asked anyone who stuck around long enough watching this video, don't buy this game. It's a terrible game, so you'd be wasting your money and time for starters, but morally, don't buy this game. Watch Let's Plays, watch streams of it, but don't give Nude Maker and Plays and Games any more money for this project, because they don't deserve it. Instead, I'm going to list some excellent indie games that were made with a fraction of Nightcry's budget, and yet are better than Nightcry could ever hope to be. While not exactly a horror game per se, even though it definitely has some horrifying elements, it's hard to talk about indies and not mention Undertale. The gameplay and visual design are very reminiscent of games like Yume Nikki and Mad Father from the RPG maker Golden Era of the mid-2000s, with a very quirky cast of characters and one of the best soundtracks I've ever heard in a game. While Nightcry had a budget of $300,000, Undertale was developed by only one person on a budget of about $50,000, and yet has gone on to sell over 1 million copies, often being called one of the best games ever made. Omori released in 2020 and has since become one of the most beloved indie horrors of recent years. 
It tells a very touching story with a wonderful eye for visual design. While Nightcry had a $300,000 budget, Omori had a budget of roughly $30,000. Five Nights at Freddy's, a game that forever changed the landscape of the horror genre and helped bring indie horror into the public conscience, has a simple but effective gameplay style, a unique premise, and excellent sound design. The game was only made by one person in 2014, and yet Five Nights at Freddy's has since fostered one of the most dedicated fan bases in gaming. When Nightcry had a budget of $300,000, Five Nights at Freddy's was made on a budget of just roughly $10,000. Hell, while we're at it, let's throw the mother of all RPG Maker games in there too. Yume Nikki itself, the game that started this style of retro pixel horror, released in 2004 by just one developer. It's one of my personal favourite games of all time and is a psychedelic, weird, unsettling dive into the dreams of the main character. It's not for everyone, but it's definitely a game you'll never forget and it is completely free to download on Steam. Man, you know, having to play Ghost Head and then going into Nightcry, dude, I, I need a good game. <laughs> I, I need something good. I need a palate cleanser. We've almost played all of the games in the Clock Tower Cinematic Universe, but we've got one more game still to look at. Haunting Ground. You know, with all the positive things people say about Haunting Ground, it's insane how both Nightcry and Haunting Ground exist in the same timeline. Both spiritual successors to the same franchise and yet so dramatically different in every way. This game is even considered to be a PS2 survival horror cult classic, one of the hidden gems of the genre, and that's why next time we're going to look at Haunting Ground in more detail. We're going to see what makes this game such a cult classic, and how it holds up almost 20 years after its release. Hopefully it's somewhat good, because lord knows I can't take much more of this shit. Bye bye Howdy! Thank you for watching the video and looking at the dark, dark history of probably one of the biggest insults to survival horror, to be honest. <laughs> I stream retro and indie horror games three times a week over on Twitch. Uh, the games are much better than Nightcry, trust me. <laughs> so feel free to pop over and say hi sometime. Uh, same goes for my Twitter, where I post updates on all that video shiz. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time to finally look at a good game, Haunting Ground. <laughs> uh, bye bye.